Next, we have um, Becky Kelly, who's the president of the Washington Environmental Council. And uh, it's really great to have her here. She's an accomplished environmentalist. She's led numerous successful campaigns, including the 2005 effort to pass Washington's first law requiring public buildings to meet green standards. And also in 2008, she established Washington's greenhouse gas emissions limits. So um, really important work. So welcome, Becky. A, um, terrific group, a different group than I usually maybe get a chance to talk to, which is fun. Although my husband is a UX designer, so I feel <laughs> at home. He wants to say Amazon, I hope that doesn't cause any misses. <laughs> He's a good guy. Um, so I want to, I'm going to look at my phone right now, make sure I don't go over. I'll probably talk fast um, and I'll, I'll cut myself off if I need to. So um, Washington Environmental Council is a state level advocacy organization. We're a nonprofit, we do public policy. We help uh, pass laws, make sure that they're enforced, make sure they're funded, um, and mostly how we do that is by getting actually average folks, voters, um, involved in the process, um, advocating with decision makers. We're coming up on our 50th year. We were founded in 1967, um, and I've actually been there for 22 years, a very long time. I started as our office manager. I was thinking about that this evening. I think it means I'm stubborn, warmly, maybe. <laughs> but we do good work. Um, and. All you have to do is look out this window um, to be reminded of why it is important to protect this place we live. It's pretty fantastic. I also saw a baby in the back, which is always another good reminder <laughs> of why we do this. Um, so I was thinking it'd be fun, you know, you can always dig deep on one issue or kind of give a sampler platter of different things going on. And I thought, you know, I'll just kind of tell you who we are, what we do, what some of the big issues are facing Washington, both challenges and opportunities. And hopefully that something in what I say is is interesting or makes you want to dig a little bit deeper and you can find us or find me afterwards and, and think about whether there's something here that you want to be a part of. Um, so I'll start out with a couple high-level themes that kind of affect all the aspects of Washington's environment, walk through our programs, uh, give you some examples because some of this stuff can be kind of conceptual until you get some real example to dig your mind into um, and talk a little bit about how we how we get done and what we get done. Uh, so the themes. Um, on my screen, but not here. There we go. Um, so you may or may not think of yourself as an environmentalist or a conservation-minded person. I don't know that most people do, frankly. Um, but most of us care about the place we live, and, and we know that it's important. Um, and one of the one of the big themes I think that makes sort of environmental protection relevant um, everywhere, but especially right here, right now, is actually kind of probably the workforce that's represented in this room. Um, you think about the growth happening in this region, how our local businesses are able to attract talented people who want to come and live here is often due to the fact that you can you know, get out of town on the weekend and go skiing, or you can be in a desert and you know, three or four hour drive, you can go to the ocean, you can be out on Puget Sound. And, and so in that way, um, the environment and the economy are really pretty intertwined. Um, another, and that's a positive theme. I think that's kind of a, an opportunity for us as we work to protect the environment, is reminding people it's not just a nice to have, it's actually a must have for the economy. Um, the picture of the bridge is meant to represent one of the other big challenges we face in Washington right now, and that is, um, this is, this is on the challenge side. We have a crisis of infrastructure. Um, this bridge, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, looks pretty good. Um, but we all know we had a bridge fall into a river a couple of years ago. Um, and anyone who reads the newspaper knows that um, not only our phys uh, physical infrastructure, our built infrastructure, but our fiscal infrastructure is not performing super well in this state. Um, our state legislature is being held in contempt by our state Supreme Court for failing to adequately fund K through 12 education. They're accruing large fines constantly. Um, and they can't get their act together to figure out what we need to do to fund education. Um, so these problems have direct impacts on the environment. Obviously, if we, um, if we don't have good infrastructure systems to, to um, treat the runoff, the oily, chemically runoff that comes off of our pavement, and it just goes directly into the sound, um, that's going to cause problems for us. So that's a kind of direct example. The education funding thing means that when my organization goes to Olympia, when the legislature kicks off in January, 
we're trying to get people's attention about these really critical environmental issues, and we're competing for airtime and dollars and, and brain space um, with really basic functions like K through 12 education. So that's a big challenge. Um, and then another overarching theme is the fact that um, much of the environmental movement, sort of as it's been traditionally put together, is, is white-led, white organizations, um, who have been really out of touch with communities of color, with um, the sort of needs and the, all the things that other communities bring to the table. And that's something that the environmental community is really grappling with right now. Um, and my organization has been doing some deep dive on that and finding that, wow, we have, if we want to be relevant and if we want to be good at what we do and if we want to be powerful and if we want to meet our mission, we had better um, transform ourselves, both in who we are, in who we connect with, in who holds power, in who holds resources. Um, and I'm super excited about that work. I think it is going to make um, the environmental movement a lot more relevant and a lot richer and a lot smarter. So those are some of the big sort of things that our work is operating inside of, some of the big trends. Um, these are the big four, and this will get slightly more visually interesting in a minute. <laughs> I'm a little sensitive in a room like this. Um, I'm glad my whole presentation doesn't look like this. Um, but these are, the four, these are the four areas that we focus on sort of programmatically. Climate and clean energy, evergreen forests, protecting Puget Sound through our People for Puget Sound program, and then this issue of fossil fuel infrastructure. And it's not too hard to imagine that these things connect, because they do. Everything connects. It gets complicated, but the connections are interesting and fun. Um, so just, just to think about the fact in a way that it's good that there is a group who is working on all these different pieces, to think about the ways these connect. Um, if we're putting in oil terminals, we're causing more climate pollution. If we're growing healthy forests, they're storing carbon that can help ameliorate climate change. Um, when we're taking care of those forests, they're also producing clean water. So all these things connect, and that makes our work interesting and more complicated. Um, so our People for Puget Sound program just, just highlights of what we do. Basically, we're trying to get to a healthy Puget Sound for us, but for the critters too. Um, and a big issue around the health of the sound is how we develop, how we grow, how we get around, where we live. Um, so to give you one specific example to kind of dig in on there, this is um, one of the big issues we're working on is how do you treat um, polluted stormwater runoff? Do you just let it run off the roads right into the sound? Do you have it run off into like a big concrete tank and just kind of sit there <laughs> and slowly sift in? Or, and this is kind of a new project, so you can see it hasn't grown up too much yet, but what we're learning is that green infrastructure, um, basically letting plants and soil filter the water, um, has a great capacity to take the pollutants out of the water. Um, so we're doing a, a ton of work at the state level to get funding for things like this, which is at um, Point Defiance down in Tacoma, um, to be built, projects across the state. And ultimately, it's actually this junk, this sort of toxic soup that comes off the roads, that is the number one um, problem for the health of Puget Sound. The problem is, like most things, it's kind of invisible. You know, it looks good, so we don't see um, all the toxins that are accumulating there, but they are a real issue. And this is a, just another example of green infrastructure. That's that, um, this is South Park in South Seattle is the bridge that they rebuilt down there. Um, and this is a whole sort of green infrastructure project um, to filter those pollutants. And as you're here, thinking back to the kind of fiscal infrastructure problems of our state, this stuff is great, but it does cost money. Um, and so where we've had some success getting money through the state budget to build these projects, um, we need to take it to scale. And that is a challenge right now, but we're working on it. So a threat <laughs> that Puget Sound faces that's a bit more profound comes from um, the prospect of fossil fuels being transported through the state. Um, and you'll see some more pictures. Um, this is actually an oil train derailment in Mosier, Oregon that happened this summer. Um, I think that's, yeah, it's Mount Hood in the background. Um, so because we're located on the west coast of the United States and because we have ports and we have access uh, routes to Asia and to other world markets, we are a hotspot for people wanting to send oil um, from the new sort of deposits where they're fracking in the center of the country um, out through our ports to, um, to other places, including actually for refining in California. 
um, and also coal to um, different ports in, in Asia. So over the past few years, a big, uh, this has really come, come up over the last five years or so, there's been a big citizens movement um, to stop this from happening, basically to stop us from turning into a big hub for fossil fuel export, both for oil and coal. Um, and the idea is not to just say no, the idea is that we actually are, it's late in the game <laughs> to be developing big um, new fossil fuel proposals and what we need to be doing is transferring over to clean energy as quickly as possible. And when you put in place big expensive infrastructure, the problem is there's a lot of sunk capital in it and it's pretty hard to get people to move off of it until they've made their money back. So we're at a pivotal moment to prevent that, that new infrastructure siting. Um, so these are places in Washington, the, um, the X's are, are actually proposals that have been defeated. Um, the red indicates coal and the orange indicates oil. So you can see we have been besieged. Um, you can also see that we have done a good job in defeating many of those proposals. The exclamation points are places where a proposal is still alive. Um, an enormous, enormous uh, oil terminal is proposed for Vancouver, Washington, and a couple out in Grace Harbor on the coast, um, and also a big coal terminal in Longview. So those, those fights are still underway, but we have made a tremendous amount of progress. Um, and it's not a hypothetical. <laughs> that's the tunnel, the train tunnel that goes under downtown Seattle, um, and that's an oil train. Uh, I work at Third and Union, and I think if an oil train exploded, it would probably, you know, who knows what, what it would do in terms of sort of melting <laughs> the area where our office is located. Um, and the, again, there's an alternative. This is actually wind turbine parts um, on trains. And this is, we're not, we're not anti-training. This is what we would love to see on trains. In Vancouver, uh, Washington, there's actually a conflict. They're already shipping wind uh, turbine parts through Vancouver. And there's a fear that if the oil trains come, they're going to kind of push the wind turbines off the tracks in terms of capacity, which is, would be a sad thing indeed. Um, and this is another place where, um, where the work around racial equity kind of intersects. Um, this is a, Fawn Sharp is the um, chairwoman of the Quimel Indian Nation, and um, tribes have played a really key role in this fight over fossil fuel infrastructure, standing up for their uh, treaty rights with the U.S. government, and making sure that they can still fish and you know live the lives that um, they have lived for a very long time, unharmed by these fossil fuels. Um, let's see how I'm doing. All right, I'm gonna pick up the pace. So a couple more program areas. We also work on forests. So we're the evergreen state. Half the state is forested, and half of that is owned either by private timber companies or the state. And that's where most of the logging in Washington happens, is on that roughly quarter of our state. Um, so we're trying to work on, we've always worked on the rules, trying to make sure that logging rules are as strict as they can be. We've gotten pretty far, but you can still do some fairly gnarly things, and you may have driven past some of those, depending on where you recreate in Washington. Um, and we really we have great productive forests in Washington. We have amazing tree growing ground, and they grow big and happy here. <laughs> um, and they can store a ton of carbon, they can provide clean air and clean water. So we try to figure out how can we get that next sort of increment of benefit? Um, how can we make that pencil for companies financially? So we're actually building out some new sort of financial models such that people can sort of get paid for their carbon storage in their forest or growing their trees longer or some of the other sort of ecosystem services that don't usually get accounted for because all we're counting is the two by fours. Um, and we have done a very cool project with Microsoft. Microsoft um, has imposed a, a price on carbon just as a matter of what they wanted to do. Um, as, a, as a part of their commitment around climate change. And so they look for, you know, they reduce emissions as much as they can, but huge server, server farms, huge offices, there's still a lot of emissions. And so they're looking for projects where they can basically offset um, their carbon footprint. So we did a project with them down in the Nisqually River area down sort of between, um, between Tacoma and Olympia, where they purchased um, carbon credits that allowed us and a partner, a land trust partner, to buy this land and to ensure that um, for the next 100 years it will be managed for carbon storage um, and growing those trees bigger and, and cleaning the air and cleaning the atmosphere. Um, so that's a terrific example that we are working, again, it's like a, a pilot learning how to do it and then how can we spread it, spread it far. Um, so climate and clean energy is our um, 
the last program area I wanted to talk about, and uh, it's a big one, <laughs> for sure. And I would say this, this is one that could probably merit its own presentation or two, it may come up in Q&A, but um, this is a place where we are basically working to build a bigger tent. If you think of climate change as an environmental issue, and that a few hardy environmentalists can uh, take on the largest corporations in the world in terms of the fossil fuel industry and sort of change how we power the world, um, you're wrong. Um, I, I, was on that, I was on that boat for a little while and uh, it, it didn't work. <laughs> so, and shame on us, right? This is a big societal problem and we really need to all tackle it together. Um, so we've been building a broader coalition um, of uh, businesses who want to do clean energy, of labor unions who want to be involved in building the clean energy future, in social justice and community of color organizations who want to make sure that the transition um, to clean energy doesn't um, further impact um, communities of color, but in fact helps to improve their position um, and sort of bring, bring those communities um, to a healthier place and to be part of the clean economy. Plus environmental groups, American Lung Association, all these folks. So the short story there is we are, um, we are engaging young people, we are engaging a much broader coalition, and we hope to be bringing forward um, some pretty exciting new policies with this broader coalition and, and working together on that. That's something I'm happy to, happy to talk more about. This is just kind of some of what it looks like to be working together. That was a march in downtown Seattle in the fall. Um, so just quickly to kind of wrap things up, the way we do all these things um, is we work directly with government leaders um, and try to influence the decisions they make in Olympia. Um, and the main way you do that, you can send lobbyists down there, but we're never going to have as many lobbyists as the industries who are advocating for their interests. Um, our superpower, our tool, uh, is really the public. It's voters, it's citizens, it's residents of Washington who ultimately get to decide who's governor, who's commissioner of public lands, who represents them in the legislature, um, what kinds of transit projects are passed, all those things. Um, and that's, that's really our power, um, is doing that. So, you know, we work, there's governor, uh, having a green lobby day in Olympia, um, and that's important, super important. But really, the voices that we are bringing to the rotunda, um, and to the governor and to others, are the voices of people. Um, and and uh, it's a pretty hopeful process, because I have seen in the time that I've been doing this work that these voices, these activists, these people, have the power to bring about huge change. Um, not necessarily quite as fast, maybe, as we need it sometimes, um, but we are getting there, and it's, it's an exciting thing to be part of. And I think um, we're finally realizing the way to connect the dots between environment, economy, racial justice, some of these big things going on in our society, because you really can't pull them apart. Just like those interlocking circles, they're all interlocking, um, and we're trying to bring that sort of more sophisticated understanding and partnerships to our work. So thank you so much.